In his 1966 fictional novel, Silence, which was made into a film last year, author Shusaku Endo tells the story of a young 17th century Portuguese priest named Sebastião Rodriguez, who along with another Jesuit, are sent to Japan to encourage the growing Christian community there. Father Rodriguez arrives to find that the church has been driven underground. A great persecution has been taking place, initiated by the new ruling party who has outlawed the Christian faith and who have commissioned agents to seek out hidden Christians called Kakure Karishitan and to put them to a test. When they find someone suspected of being a Christian, they put before them a carved image of Jesus' face and order them to trample upon it. If they don't, they will be imprisoned, tortured, and perhaps even executed as a martyr. If they do, they will be released, but they will go forth knowing they have denied their faith, denied Christ, and that will bring great shame upon themselves. Many give in, and many don't, refusing and suffering the consequences. Father Rodriguez is eventually caught up in the sweeps and is rounded up. After refusing to trample upon the image of Jesus, he is first imprisoned, then tortured. And when that doesn't result in his recanting his faith, the officials force him to watch as others are tortured until he gives in. He becomes deeply conflicted by this, and in his journal considers what he is to do. Christ above is to be revered, for he is holy and good. To degrade the image of the Lord by trampling upon it is unfathomable. But it's, it's one thing to suffer for your own faith, but to allow someone else to suffer for your faith, it's a different thing altogether. He wonders whether he's being self-centered and unmerciful in holding out, even perhaps unchristian, to allow another to suffer so that he can uphold the ideals of his faith causes him great pain. He prays to God about this, what am I to do? But his prayers go unanswered. To him, it appears that Christ is silent on the matter, and the priest appears to be left to his own devices to determine what to do. Again, he is brought before the image of Christ, again asked to trample upon it. The moans of those suffering because of him holding to his faith all around him. And he's given the ultimatum. Trample on this image of Christ or suffering of the others will continue. As he gazes once upon the image of Jesus Christ, he prays again. Prays to God on high and to his son. And this time, Christ, who has been silent for so long, speaks to Father Rodriguez. You may trample. You may trample. I, more than anyone, know the pain of your foot. You may trample. It was to be trampled on by men that I was born into this world. It was to share men's pain that I carried my cross. You may trample. And so with the confidence that his actions will spare the suffering of others and that he has permission from his savior whose calling it was to do just as the priest will do, Father Rodriguez faithfully tramples upon the image and the story ends. I get chills every time I read these words of Christ that Shusaku Endo imagined. You may tramp. While his novel is just that, a fictional story, I think Endo came to a place of acceptance about Jesus that many of us struggle with. Like Father Rodriguez, we like to put Jesus up on a pedestal in heaven rather than on a cross or even a lowly manger. We like our Jesus lifted up, resurrected and whole, looking down on us from heaven, being for us when things are going well and working against our sinful nature when they're not. What we struggle with is just that, Jesus being with us. 
in the struggles of our world, in the filth and grime of our messy lives, we don't want our image of Jesus to be mired by our mire. We want to keep him pure, set apart, heavenly, and preserved in his divinity for all eternity. And yet, as the author Endo identified and the Gospels testify, he wasn't sent into our world to only experience the best of our humanity, or even to just rule and reign above us. He was sent by God, as Endo writes, to be trampled on, to share our pain, to be God with us, Emmanuel. The Emmanuel, who had been promised by God through the prophecy of Isaiah, and delivered to people who had just as hard a time accepting this version of Jesus as we do. In the brief scripture passage that Karen read this morning, we learn of a conversation that is taking place between King Ahaz of Judah and the prophet of God, Isaiah. King Ahaz is in a really bad spot. The kingdom is divided. Israel, called the Ephraim, and the nation of Aram have teamed up with each other and are attempting to evade King Ahaz in Jerusalem and replace him with a puppet ruler who will support their coalition against the Assyrian Empire. Suffice it to say, this is a very messy situation. Ahaz is terrified. If Israel succeeds, not only is his personal life threatened, but God's promise that a descendant of the great King David would always be on the throne in Jerusalem will be trampled upon. And so God sends Isaiah with a message bearing a sign to Ahaz. Initially, Ahaz refuses receiving the sign. His confidence in God is pretty low at this point, and he's afraid to test God lest things get even worse for him. In his view, and the predominant view of the time, there's only three ways that God interacts with humanity. First, God is always physically <clears throat> located above, looking down on us on earth. That's why you have to have an intermediary like Moses or King David or Isaiah. And second, God is either for us because we're doing what God wants and evidenced by when things are going well in our lives or against us when we're sitting and when evidenced by when things are not going well, like when two nations are threatening your very existence, the line of King David and the holy city of Jerusalem. Clearly God is against Ahaz, not pleased with him. So best not to add insult to injury by testing God and asking for a sign that God will faithfully keep his promises. As we picked up the scripture, we read that God is a little bit wearied by Ahaz's lack of trust. But God gives the sign anyway. <clears throat> Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on your ancestral home, David's home, such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim, Israel, departed from Judah. This sign, a child born who will be Emmanuel, God with us. Now this is a wholly new concept about how God works in the world for Ahaz. And if we're honest with ourselves, like him, humanity has struggled ever since Emmanuel was announced to wrap our minds around what it means for God to be with us. Like Ahaz, we often learn to hold God in such high regard, relegating God to a location above us, therefore far from us. Though we've heard the prophecies year after year and have already sung, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we still get stuck on the idea that, that God is far removed from us, dwelling in his heavenly kingdom and is only for us when we are perfect and deserving and against the sin that takes over our lives. As a result, we hesitate. We hesitate to trust that God is really at work with us in our lives, and thus don't dare hope for a sign that he wants anything to do with our ceaseless struggles. And yet, that's exactly what God wants. It's what God has always wanted. Not to only be seen as above us, or simply for, or against us, but always with us. 
And so, like with Ahaz, God has ignored our fears and distrust, and God sent the sign anyway. His son, Jesus Christ, sent to be with us, to join our struggle, to live with the trampled upon and to be trampled upon. As we know from the Gospels in his life, ministry, and death, Jesus experienced all the worst of the human condition and all the worst of how we can treat each other. His friends deserted him, his enemies bullied him, his loved ones betrayed him, just like we do. He experienced the grief of losing a loved one, the challenge of resisting the temptations of wealth, power, and the ego. He struggled with what God was asking him to do, just like we do. He suffered physically, emotionally, and spiritually, just like we do. And ultimately, he experienced death and resurrection, just as we will. Because he experienced all this, when he came upon others who were likewise struggling, he didn't meet them with a holier-than-thou attitude, though he certainly was. He didn't tell those for whom all was going well that it was because they were perfect and that God favored them more than anyone else. And he didn't tell those who were going through hard times, who were being trampled on by others, that God was against them because of their sin. No. Instead, when Jesus met with someone who had been rejected by others, he spent time with them and offered acceptance. When he came upon someone who had been condemned by others, he comforted them and offered justice. When the sick or dying came or were brought to him, he healed them and offered peace. When all the world seemed to trample upon someone, Jesus offered a hand, brought them to their feet, and stood in solidarity for them, or even offered himself to be trampled on instead. Because this is who he was meant to be. Sent from heaven above into our messy world down here. To be trampled on for and even by everyone. To give his life to finish the struggle against all that separates us from God once and for all. To fulfill God's promise that God's desire for creation to be the long-awaited Emmanuel, God with us, is taking place right now down here. And I can't think of a better time than now for that promise to once again be shared with our world, where wars still wage, power and wealth still tempt, where the poor and outcasts are still trampled upon by the rich and popular, where loneliness, grief, and shame keep us from fully engaging with others, and where many still don't know they can trust God's faithfulness and experience the promise of Emmanuel. In the book that accompanies our Advent devotional, the two authors lift up the reality that Christmas can often be the loneliest time of year for many of us. Not only is it a dark time of the year seasonally, but it's also a time when social pressures to conform to the ideal of having a perfect, happy life can be magnified to a crushing level. It's also a time when grief of a lost one is amplified, when shame about a broken relationship hits a fever pitch, and when the disappointments and failures of the past come back to haunt us. Add to that the idea that everything has to be perfect in all aspects of your life in order for Jesus to come down into the world on Christmas Eve, and you have a recipe for feeling pretty alone tonight. But that's where we come in. As Christians, we know what tonight is. Tonight is the night where we remember and celebrate that Jesus was born to be God's promise to be with us fulfilled. That he's the one sent from heaven into our world to show that God has always been for us and never against us. To teach us that more than anything, God has always wanted to be with us and that we are never alone. When we accept that teaching, when we receive that gift of Emmanuel into our lives, we receive more than just that promise fulfilled. We receive the same calling given to Jesus to teach and share with the world what a with us God looks like. We do this by 
being with people when things aren't perfect, when they're overcome with loneliness, grief, shame, or, or what have you. We do this by sharing our own stories of how welcoming God to be a part of our messy lives has transformed us, imperfect as we are. And we do this by caring for others and standing with them when they are trampled by the injustices in our world. And we do this when we take on our experience of God's promise to be with us and we embody it to another. That's the wonder of this promise. It wasn't made to one person in one place to be carried out by one person at one time. It's a promise made to all creation throughout all time, brought to fulfillment by his son and passed on by all who call him Lord. And so tonight is the night when we remember the promise and our role in it, when we will gather at the manger side to see the face of Jesus, to know him to be Emmanuel, God with us, the one sent into our world, the one to be with us, with the trampled, to be trampled, and to save us all. So wherever you might find yourself tonight, here or elsewhere, I hope you'll make your way to the manger, and I hope you'll invite others to join you so that you and all the world can receive once again the promise our God made, that Emmanuel, God with us, would be sent into our world to be with us forever and ever. Amen. Our song